My name is Cash Jackson. I'm a retired Navy veteran. I'm also the 2018 gubernatorial candidate for the Libertarian Party in the state of Illinois. Yeah. That applause alone will tell you right there that people want change. Yes, that's right. Many of you guys may not know, but on Saturday kicked off, uh, Saturday was Armed Forces Day. And so this week, this entire week is Armed Forces Week leading up to Memorial Day. And uh, who in here knows a veteran, knows a service member, family, friend, whatever? Raise your hand for me. All right, now look around. Look around. That's a lot of people, okay? You guys are connected to the men and women that support this nation, that support our freedoms and our liberties. And you being here today is representing what I'm going to talk about today. I want to talk about mission readiness. What is mission readiness and what is mission capability and how is family law impacting directly the military, which in turn is also impacting our communities. So the, the definition is a little long, so I had to write it down, sorry to you. Uh, current approaches to measuring military readiness allows units to capture both their preparedness to execute core functions, what units are assigned to do and their ability to perform assigned missions, what units are tasked to do based on the, the measurement of defined readiness inputs, including various personnel equipment. What does that really mean to you? Well, it means how capable is our military at any given time? How prepared are, or ready are they? A couple of key things make up our military. Well, we have to have equipment. Uh, we have to have uh, logistics and supply. But the most important thing we have to have is personnel, it's people. We can't get the job done, we can't be effective, we cannot be efficient without strong-minded, strong-bodied men and women serving this country and supporting and defending our Constitution. Family law is adversely affecting mission readiness. It is destroying, whether or not the Department of Defense realizes it, whether or not Congress understands or grasps this concept, our ability to deploy and effectively defend our country and our national interests lies on how well-grounded our men and women are when they don that uniform. When they put that uniform on, they have to be of sound mind and sound body to deploy, to go out, because if they do not, I can tell you firsthand, I can tell you that if they are not mentally and emotionally prepared to meet the challenges before them because their mind is back home, they're not going to be effective and moreover, it's placing their fellow service members' lives at risk. If you're not 110% on your game, on the battlefield, on that, sh on that ship, in that foxhole, you're not 110%, your brain and your mind is back home wondering um, what's happening with your children, what's happening with your family, your focus isn't where it should be. And your focus should be on watching your brother six. That's where it's gotta be. And I'm gonna give you an anecdotal story here. In the summer of 2000, July 23rd, 2000, an Air Force Master Sergeant, uh, father of four, he uh, was stationed in Enid, Oklahoma. He went to pick up uh, his younger two sons. Uh, the gentleman had went through a divorce, went through a very difficult time, and, whew, man, you guys got me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not gonna happen. Ah, <laughs> uh, went through a divorce. Went to and he went to pick up his two sons, his two young sons, take them to the movies. And when he got there, there was a gentleman there, a retired captain out of the Air Force by the name of Robert Pinter, and it was somebody that his now ex-wife was seeing. But this gentleman uh, made a statement to this man that said, "You know, I can take your two kids from you." I can make it to where you can't see your two kids. What that man, I don't think, entirely realized is that that had happened to him already about 22 years before that. This man had 19 years in the, in the Air Force, very well decorated. By all accounts, he was uh, what we would label a national hero, right? He had served his country honorably for 19 years getting ready to retire from the Air Force. And that statement triggered something inside that man. He drove to his apartment, he picked up a 357 revolver, he went back to the house, he went inside the house and found Mr. Pinter. He shot him six times with a 357 and then sat down on the couch and waited for the police to arrive. 
What most of you don't know is that was my dad. I see them all the time, standing out there with signs, homeless, help, you know, we'll work for food, whatever, I see it. We're celebrating Armed Forces Week with people living on the streets. What are we celebrating? These are men and women that deploy from you in your communities, in your families. We probably got some um, yellow ribbon families out here right now. Do we have any? Yeah? How are we doing? Right now, let me give you some demographics on our homeless, homeless situation. We've got about 91% men, 9% women, 45% are African American or Hispanic. A huge disproportionate number there. What really concerns me isn't the numbers. What concerns me is the knowledge. The knowledge that the Veterans Administration, in cooperation with the Office of Child Support Enforcement, conducted a three-year study from 2008 to 2010, and they surveyed 14,000 homeless veterans. And as a, as a society, we're led to believe that veterans are struggling because the VA sucks, because they're not receiving mental health services that they need. We're being fed a lie because 14,000 homeless veterans overwhelmingly stated that their greatest unmet needs revolved around what happens when you go through family court. I've got the study right there. It's right there if you want to see it. Like many of you, I've done everything to contact every single person I knew to contact, legislators, senators, house reps, um, I mean, you name it. I've reached out to them and tried to say, look, we've got a problem here, and the VA knows about it. Why does the VA know about it, and we're not talking about it? We're not having the discussion about how to end homelessness amongst our veteran community. And if it's affecting them, if they're doing it to veterans, not to say that we deserve a special place, but if they're doing it to men and women that have served their country, it's not a far stretch to know and think that they're doing it to every other citizen out there because they are. We know this. We know it to be true. That they are literally forcing people into homelessness. Every single day, veterans commit suicide at a significant rate. We're led to believe it's because of post-traumatic stress. We're led to believe that it's because of being in combat in war. What, what do you think transpires in an individual's mind when they have served their country, oftentimes sacrificing uh, body and mind, believing that when they came home, they're going to return home and be cared for, <coughs> to find that they're going to be labeled a monster, that they're baby killers, that they're not suitable to be parents to their children, yet... Science and medicine overwhelmingly tells us the best thing to help a struggling veteran, and I'll go beyond just a veteran, a just a normal person, is their family. 
just their family, the support unit, to help them in that difficult time. That is the most important thing. And you take that veteran who served and sacrificed, and you strip them from their family. You tell them, no, you know what? You're not good enough to be a father. You're not good enough to be a mother. We think you have PTSD. We have such a low evidentiary standard at preponderance that we're not going to prove anything. We're going to make allegations against you to justify the actions that we're going to do in removing you systematically out of your child's life. We're going to place hurdles and obstacles for you all along the way to make you jump over one after another after another, simply fighting to be a parent to your children. Why is it that the greatest threat to our nation's heroes isn't a foreign fighter in Afghanistan. The greatest threat to our heroes are in a black robe. I can't tell you how angry I get every time I set foot in my own courthouse to see this huge display of we honor our veterans. You do? Well, let's talk about that. I don't like really interjecting my case too much, but I will for the sake of the venue. I've been to court over 100 times. I spent over $50,000. I've represented myself for nearly two years. And whenever I first went into activism and I held a sign, a cardboard sign that said, I pay $20,000 in attorney costs, I pay over $1,000 a month in child support, I'm dead broke, not dead beat. Judge says, Judge says to me, that's harassing. Yes. Come again? Uh, to who? To your ex-wife. Well, wait a minute. She doesn't even have Facebook. How's that harassing? What did the judge do? He said, uh, I'm going to extend this emergency order of protection for that. You're going to pay in your last several months of military service $35 an hour for one hour on Saturdays to see your kids. So in my last few months of military service, after having done 20 years, having a top secret clearance, entrusted with national secrets that still remain here, and they will till I die, being a reserve sheriff's deputy, I have to pay to see my children. What kind of a country am I living in? I looked at the judge and I said, the best thing you could have done was given me my children because now I'm going to spend every waking moment of my life trying to ensure that you and that attorney get disbarred because you shouldn't be practicing law. And that's exactly what I'm working on right now. <laughs>